Welcome to both success and integrity with Bessie Graham, a podcast dedicated to established business leaders like you, ready to bring more meaning into your life in a way that strengthens rather than threatens the financial stability of your business. I'm your host, Bessie Graham. I've worked with business owners, governments, and large funding bodies like the United Nations for over 20 years to bring doing good and making money back together. So let's unpack why you don't have to choose between experiencing success or having integrity in your life. There are more slaves now than at any point in history. In fact, we have more slaves today in 2023 than the whole transatlantic slave trade put together. Modern slavery is an issue your business is coming up against, whether you're conscious of it or not. I'm passionate about supporting you as an established business leader to understand the impacts your business is having, positive and negative, and to take a more intentional approach to the decisions you are making and the way that you're spending money. A significant part of that taps into who you are procuring goods and services from. Today's conversation may feel slightly overwhelming, but it is an important one. And we have done our best to make it as practical and actionable as possible. So rather than feel overwhelmed and put your head in the sand, it's time to listen to two of the leaders in the field and begin to chart a roadmap for your organization. You can play an important role in ending modern slavery. And I'm here to help you figure out the way to do that so that it's a win-win that strengthens your business and creates a positive impact in the world. Today I'm joined by Carolyn and Fuzz Kitto, the co-directors of Be Slavery Free, an organisation seeking to prevent, disrupt and abolish modern slavery. They bring a passion and commitment to this important topic that is backed up with extensive experience working with businesses to equip business leaders to make the necessary changes and play their role in ending modern slavery. Thank you both so much for joining us in what is a really important topic and conversation for business leaders to get their heads around. Um, I'm wondering if we start with the framing of an established business leader, so they're not a startup, they're not struggling to kind of figure out the commercial aspects, the business is running well, but they are shifting to begin to think differently about what could it look like to stop thinking about good as something that's external to the business and instead make that shift to say, what are those decisions we have control over? How are we spending money? And and think about the good the business itself could do I'm wondering if if you guys could first up just give us a little bit of a pretend we don't know anything. So start from the beginning and maybe even just start with what is modern day slavery and why is it something that business leaders should be thinking about? Well, we came into this uh, and, and that was exactly our experience. We had had some connections with it. Uh, Carolyn had been working with aid and development areas, et cetera, on that. So we'd had that thing. But when we came to really face it and work through the most important question, which is what do we do about it? You really got to know what it is. So, uh, and definition is really important because definition creep is such a reality. And so we are very, very careful that we define modern slavery as modern slavery. So easy labor abuse creeps in. So, Carolyn, definition that we work on. So there, there are we won't go into all of this, but there are a number of UN protocols and definitions that are now broadly accepted. Um, and uh, I use the acronym AMP, 
if I'm clicking use different acronyms, but I can remember that. It's one. not the company. It's not the company. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, uh, th- there is the so A is the action, and and the action is uh, is about recruitment of of people, um, and then M is the method. The method is uh, through coercion or deception. Um, uh, they are they are recruited. Now that means they're promised one thing, and what they find is something totally different. And then the P is the purpose, and the purpose of uh, of these this action and the method in which it's done is is for the benefit of another person through exploitation. So let me put that into a. Um, a story because that's often the way that we we uh, we hear things better. You know, somebody might be um, well. Let's put it into the Australian context, but this works as well in the US, UK, EU context. Somebody is uh, living in in a Pacific island, and someone says, "My uncle can get you a job as a seasonal worker on a farm in Australia." And you will uh, you'll have good accommodation. You'll have good working hours. You'll get two days off a week, and you will get paid this amount. And you can send money back and home, you can which send would be money back home, um, to to your family. Uh, and actually, after you've done this for a little while, we'll get a visa for them to come and join you. And so you say, "Oh well, this this just sounds like you know the solution to my dreams," and and so they come, and then they find, yeah, as was the case in in a, a strawberry farm in in Tasmania, that that there were um, a five bedroom house, no electricity, no sanitation, no running water, um, uh, that the. the the oven didn't work and there were about 30 plus people living in a four bedroom house. Um, they then find that they get that rent deducted from their pay at, you know, $250 a week. They get, they have to pay for the transport from there to the farm. Um, they, they don't get the amount of money that they've been promised because they're not on a wage. They're pay, being paid piece rate. So they're being paid for the number of strawberries they pick. And, and that formula is uh, ridiculous. So in other words, they've been recruited. Um, the method is they've been promised something, they've been coerced into it, they've been tricked into it, they've been deceived. Deception. And, and somebody else gets the gets the benefit of this. So that's what slavery looks like. Um, and just the term that is often used is modern slavery. Modern slavery is an umbrella. <laughs> um, it's it's not a legal term as such, but it's an umbrella that covers things like forced labour, which is what I, uh, well, deceptive recruitment, forced labour, bonded labour, where you've had to pay to get the job in the first place. You give me $5,000 and I'll get you a job. And then there's a big um, debt 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 to pay off off associated with that. Uh, There's servitude, which is working in slavery-like conditions, child labour, worst forms of child labour, Child soldiers, which is another whole spectrum, which we hope businesses that we're talking to today aren't connected with. Um, we doubt it. So it, it is an umbrella term um, and it's used, sorry to do this to your audience, Bessie, but it's used differently in different countries and jurisdictions. Yeah, but of course. That's a simple explanation. And in some ways, you know, you mentioned the use of the word modern at the beginning. I think for a lot of business owners, that's actually probably really helpful because it's an aspect where they would probably think slavery, what are you talking about? Like, is that even an issue today? Like, why would I even have to think about that as a business leader? So potentially it's just a helpful entry point to start to think about this. If we focus in on the fact that, you know, in my mind, and, and correct me if you think there's a better way to look at this, but in my mind, there's almost two categories. There can be a business leader who isn't producing a product and so might think this is irrelevant to them because they're like, I don't have a supply chain, I'm not making something. So if we start with that type of business owner who might be running a consulting group or some kind of service business who thinks, well, this isn't relevant, what are the things that actually we may not be aware of that are just part of 
general procurement or, you know, the products we are buying, even if we're not making a product, how do we make this conversation relevant for that kind of business owner? Yeah. So probably to, to understand uh, that we need to understand the extent of, of modern slavery. We're more slaves in the world now than any other point of human history. In fact, we got more slaves to, today to 2023 uh, than the whole transatlantic slave trade put together just to get perspective. It pervades, and a lot of us come about, and this is, this is in, particularly in answering that question, Bessie, is that um, what we're seeing is uh, migrant labour more than any other point of human history. And um, uh, so it's in things, as say, a service industry or might be an IT industry. Um, it's coming in the computers that we're using. It's coming in the uh, phones that we are using. It comes in the uh, subletting that we might be uh, uh, having or, you know, the cleaners or it could be the transport of getting your packages to you. Uh, if you're buying online, it can come in uh, in a whole lot of forms in the um, uh, stationery that we are using. It can be in the uh, areas of um, uh, of the uh, catering, if we are doing that, uh, construction, if we're doing that, or renovations, we are doing that. It comes into a whole lot of areas. We often use an image uh, and it's, uh, you know, you take one look and you go, what is this? And you go, oh, it's a parrot. Uh, you know, it's, it's standing on a, a pole, but it's actually a female painted. And until you actually look and have it pointed out, you can't see it's a person. You just think it's an animal or a parrot. And we, we use that a lot with slavery because you've got to learn to see it in all those areas. So if you're a small, medium-sized enterprise, an SME, uh, and you think, oh, no, it's only the big ones who are doing it. Yes, it is. To the extent uh, Australia is estimated uh, imports every year, something like uh, the vicinity of $23 billion worth of goods made by slave labour into Australia. If you're going to look at America, it goes up way higher than that. And Europe and the UK, uh, Asia, et cetera, uh, it, it, it goes uh, goes up from there. So most of our contact, it is in Australia, most of our contact is in the goods and services that we are using for our business. So how do we then, you know, one of the pieces I'm always trying to help empower business leaders to do is to not get overwhelmed by the massiveness of everything and focus back in on where am I spending money? What are the decisions I'm making? And just begin there. Because often I think, again, if we've, we're still in a mindset that sees good as external to our business, we can you know, pick some big cause and we might be really vocal about it online, but not actually understand the components or not be bringing it back inside the business. So some of what you're talking about there, Fuzz, like the size of that could make someone just go, oh, if it's a, if it's literally in every single thing I'm buying and doing, I don't even know where to start. How does someone in that category of a business where it is about the catering, it is about the paper they're using or, you know, those types of things, how do they start to inquire or investigate or learn in a way that's actually practical so that they could get to something quite concrete like a, an approved or a preferred suppliers list or something like that? How does that work? Let me start by saying, and then Karen will come in. Uh, we have a propensity, particularly in the West uh, and and certainly in Australia, we're we're renowned for it. I'll filling into the of, of, of falling into the all or nothing syndrome. If we can't do everything and find out everything about everything that might be in our supply chain, we do nothing and we go into paralysis. Uh, and so that want to start with that. And so it's really important to actually, again, learn to see, learn to listen and learn to talk about the language of it. And there is things that we can do on that. So for somebody who's who's in a business, the first starting point is to get some knowledge about about your goods and services that that you are procuring um and there's some really good um uh free tools out there like you you can pay a mozza for tools <laughs> um 
But yeah. And often on subscription per month. <laughs> yeah. And you know, we just look at it and we go, oh now you may want to go down that path. We're not saying that those tools aren't helpful. Um, but but there are free tools that are available. For example, we have a partnership with the Mekong Club. So you can find them the Mekong Club. Uh, you have to put in the Mekong Club, otherwise you'll get some other kind of business. Um, okay, we can share some of these links in the show notes. So don't worry if you're not sure on spelling. We'll we'll give you all of that. Yeah. Um, and they've got a heat map, a really, really map. good heat map by commodity. So, so you simply put in um, I'm sourcing computers or um, ICT and, and it'll come up with a heat map of, of where in the world the issues are connected with that. Now, and then it's about you deciding uh, where your high risk is. Um, and I guess the first thing that we say is much of this is solved. Human rights issues are rarely solved by compliance. Um, they're, they're more solved by conversation. And, you know, and, relation, with, and relationships. And, so, and yet that can be the scary bit, can't it? Because sometimes the reason we avoid the conversation is if we were honest, we probably don't actually want to know. So it's that bit of yeah, like yeah. ignorance, yeah. you know. <laughs> and, there's, and there's two big pitfalls you can have. Um, one is that you can say, I don't want to know. <laughs> um, and then the, sec- the second is that you can fall into what we call analysis paralysis that you spend so much time analysing where it might be. And and that's important, but you actually need to move on to addressing it, not just staying with the analysis paralysis. So, Fuzz, why don't you talk through the stages that we see a business go through in relation to this? That might be helpful. And we've really observed this across the businesses from the big businesses, and we do a lot of work with the big businesses, particularly we've got a report under the uh, Modern Slavery Act around the world and now the human rights due diligence uh, that um, uh, the EU is bringing in. And that becomes a a whole different factor again. But we've noticed that there's a process that um, often uh, businesses go through. And the first one is denial. Oh, no, no, no. There's no such thing. It's all this beat up. Is that media and new NGOs? Uh, This is is really just sort of something that you are, you know, uh, Making up. Magnifying to give yourself some business and things to do. Uh, and then we uh, they go through, oh, okay. Now, we, we have found it is in our sector, but, but it's not with us. It's in the other companies. <laughs> the next phase they often go through is, oh, gosh, it is. It is. And we may have it in our supply chain. Now, we've done the looking. Uh, we, we, there is rumors, and it could be, but, uh, but we can deal with it internally. <laughs> And then the next one that they phase they go to is, and if we had a dollar, every time we've heard this, we've been an incredibly well-resourced organisation. They say, this is more complex than we thought. <laughs> and the next phase is, we need help with this. And then the next phase, which we think is really important, is this is not just me. This is the whole sector. We've got to look at this sectorally, not just our business. So we've actually got to work with others in our situation to to share our ideas and insights and understandings. And we've often seen that process go through. Some people get stuck at different points of that, but uh, the companies that, uh, and this has nothing to do with size, the companies that really look at it come to that point where they have the realisation, they get the tools, they learn two, three really important things. They learn how to see it and how to look for it. Uh, Darren McBain, the most uh, awarded uh, global sustainability manager and the chair of our board now, which we are absolutely overwhelmed by, says, um, uh, how do you find slavery? you got to look for it. If you don't look for it, no, of course you won't find it. Um, but the big thing then comes, you got to learn to listen. And a part of that listening is to learn the language. There is a language around understanding a supply chain, understanding modern slavery. So they become key, both those processes that we go through, which is a discovery and through to action. Don't try and do everything. Most important thing is work out where your hotspots are, where most be, and develop a roadmap. Now, the guidelines for the Australian Modern Slavery Act, and it's very similar to the UK one as well, uh, still waiting for them to come out from the EU, but they say uh, develop a roadmap. 
And that's the important part. Don't try and do everything. Start with the hot spots and a, and a few commodities, then gradually gradually expand that out as you become more knowledgeable and get confidence. Yeah. And I think which that- sounds wise, because otherwise, as you said, it's that that piece of um almost giving yourself the excuse that you can just not do anything because it's too hard. Whereas if you can say the reality is these things are entrenched, that we haven't actually been conscious of it, that for the business to be able to continue, it may be that we have to set some goals and a realistic timeline of, of getting there, but first be conscious of it. So I think that's really important. Yep. I, and I think for, for any business, um, I would say where you start is is where your values are. Mm. So to articulate your values in terms of how you value um, the human life that's in your supply chain system and in your business, and that's everything from your suppliers to your customers to your shareholders to whomever. So so what? How do you value those people? And then having a con- starting a conversation, go to your supplier and say, look. We, we're we exploring the issue of modern slavery. Don't know what that is. Okay, have a look at this little video clip. It'll explain it or listen to this podcast. Um, and uh, which, which we have on our website, we ha- you know, we introduction to it all. Yeah. Um, and, and say to them, look, we're really concerned about this and we want to be the type of business that is addressing this, preventing it, um, and we don't exactly know how to do that. Um <laughs> And we think you're probably the type of business that's in the same situation as us. Can we talk about it? Can we find a way to do this together? Um, and and when that approach is taken, you will get so much further than if you just develop a code of conduct and you send it to your supplier and say, please sign. People can this. tick a box, but yeah, not actually. Please sign yeah. this code of conduct and agree that you will inform us immediately if you find any modern slavery in your supply chain um, and pass this on to your suppliers and uh, this uh, code of conduct or something more stringent onto your suppliers. Yeah, we often say, you know, it's the, it's the getting ticked off and, and the rest of us who actually know it, we get something that sounds like that. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And there's always, so uh, there's two pieces to that that come to mind, Carolyn, when you explain it that way. I think one is that my guess would be if you engage with a supplier in that way, they are also more likely to be honest with you because you haven't said, prove to me immediately you can do this or I'm no longer using your services. You haven't said I'm an expert. You've gone in and said, we're going on a journey here. We don't know exactly what it looks like or how long this is going to take. And you're almost inviting them to go on the journey with you so that then you can together figure out, wow, okay, this is more complicated than I realized going through those stages you discussed, Fuzz, where they kind of then go, oh gosh, right. Uh, But if someone's invited to go on that journey with you and is not feeling the threat of you stopping working with them if they can't prove it immediately, I would imagine they're more likely to to engage. Yeah. And, and then the second piece that, oh, sorry, you go, Karen. Mm. I was going to say what we also find is that the, the business that takes that approach to their suppliers, so we've facilitated some businesses identifying their high-risk suppliers and then um, joining in what we call a collaborative uh, approach, not a cascading approach, mm. Um the, the what the businesses who've initiated that conversation say is, gosh, we only talk for an hour and I know more about my supply chain and the risks in that hour than I would have found out by, you know, spending tens and tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars on a risk management tool. And that piece is a really important one because if you bring up the aspect of risk, I think, you know, you've touched on some of those pieces where often businesses are already being forced into this because of compliance and other things that are coming external to them. But as you said at the beginning, that's not actually the most effective way to deal with with these issues. But there is an element where often, particularly when there has been a belief that, you know, the purpose of business is profit maximization and that's our job. And then if we make enough money, we'll give a donation. When people have had that kind of approach, there's almost the excuse of, well, this would be lovely, but it's too expensive. My customers aren't going to pay a premium because I've, you know, 
gone on that soft journey that you've talked about of old people saying this is an issue. And that can be another excuse. I'm curious to hear some examples or stories of where the the risk reduction or the increasing demand from customers for transparency and and visibility of these things. What are the upsides to doing this for a business? I I think just as at the sequay into that, uh, an incredible resource, and it's really being discussed around at the moment, not just in Australia, uh, is the essay that the Australian Treasurer did uh, on new forms of capitalism. Yes, yeah, and I saw that. Shift is going, and it is an exceptionally good piece, an exceptionally good piece. He said, you know, it's been free market enterprise um, uh, capitalism, and it hasn't worked. You know, it came with the Thatcher era. It comes into business. We're here to make profits. He says, but that's not necessarily how you make profits. We think we've got to concentrate on the profits. He said, the shift that we've got to have and we've got to move to is values-based capitalism. And it's a very stimulating, and it's the cutting edge of what's happening a lot of it. We work with a lot of accountancy uh, areas in universities in social accounting. And it's how do businesses be accountable and show that they are accountable and show and evaluate what they are doing. And uh, so um, I think the, the, the thing which we're starting to realize, and we work a lot with the investment community, and the investment community is finding that those that invest in uh, more ethical uh, products and certainly a lot of the big super funds, which have billions upon billions, uh, I think it is actually in the trillions now, uh, to invest in. So the, the, the ethical investment is giving us better returns than those that are not doing that, to put it very, very simply. So one of the first benefits is um, that we realize that it's not just about profit, and there's an incredible stress on that, um, but it's really about, we're talking about humans relating to humans. So it's not like a system or a business which is a, a objective entity. Uh, uh, we're subjects. I mean, what would you rather be, an object or a subject? Human beings would much rather be a subject. And so it's about understanding in businesses, we are human beings relating to human beings. Now, we've gone back to some of our heroes, the Wilberforces, uh, Wilberforce, and the Clapham sector worked with him. They were an amazing bunch. Now, old man Josiah uh, Wedgwood, uh, was a part of that group. And he threw a plate, uh, as in like pottery throw a plate. <laughs> um, and like the Greeks do. <laughs> like, not, not, <laughs> not like the Greeks Not do. quite. <laughs> <laughs> Which I love <laughs> you know, in a good Greek restaurant or a good Greek home. But um, he, he, he threw a plate with an African man because of the transatlantic you know, slave trade on his knees in chains on one of those uh, Wedgwood sort of... Uh, um, almost terracotta background, light terracotta. And around the lip of the plate was, am I not a man and also your brother? And it so impacted the change of the laws in England that they put it on the halfpenny coin in in in, in England. So the, this, the values one is about people to people. When we look after each other, we all win. Everybody wins in this process, and we create a world which is much more like the world we'd actually all rather like to live in, not the pressure personally of we've got to get profit, got to pro-. Yes, you do have to make profit. You're a business. That's how businesses do that. But I think there are other benefits, Caroline. Yeah, so um, we work with a range of businesses, and I, I would say um, when we talk to these businesses who, who've taken this journey, um, one of the things that they often say is, yes, it costs us money. Yes, it costs us um, time. But in, in, t- in a whole range of indicators, it's been good for us. <laughs> um, uh, so it's staff retention. Um, you know, uh, w- one company said, we, we have this brilliant staff retention program. And then we started engaging modern slavery. And people would s- start to tell us that they They'd never talk about their work at, you know, a dinner party or whatever. And now they say, I work for this company and we're addressing modern slavery. And and they're proud of it. Um, And uh, staff retention in this company, when they started addressing modern slavery, went through the roof because people said, I want to work here. Um, 
the uh, businesses that we work with in this area uh, to to a business have said in the end it was more profitable mm. um, because of the reputation. Now you can also look at at the flip side of that and. It only takes one article in one newspaper and it doesn't even matter if it's right or wrong because often they're wrong. Or um, well, they can be wrong. Uh, uh, they've used definition creep, creep and they've called it slavery when it's wage theft. But this, the slavery word is what everybody remembers and that can destroy your business overnight. Um, so um, we don't want to pretend that, this isn't going to cost you anything. Uh, but at the same time, we would say there are also a lot of people making a lot of money out of platforms and consulting that are probably not necessary to for you to engage with just a little bit of culture, uh, coaching, um, yes. as to how to address it. Probably and in some to- ways, if we go back to the piece of allowing people to create a roadmap and the the time piece of I'm going to begin here, but I have a vision of where I'm heading. The sooner you begin this process, the more you're able to do that in in a way that isn't frantic or reactionary or potentially creating unintended problems. Whereas when there are these uh, external compliance type issues or customers in an increasing sense demanding these things, it actually, the longer we take to get on board, the more we're setting ourselves up to have to spend money rapidly because we feel like we're under pressure and and need to, you know, it's that old saying, put a fence at the top of the cliff instead of an expensive ambulance at the bottom. Like, what? don't wait till it's fallen off the cliff. Uh, <laughs> I think there could be some argument for that as well. Yeah, yeah, and one of the things I add to that, Bessie, is actually what we need to do as a society is build a road that doesn't go anywhere near the cliff. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> so wouldn't that be great? Yep. Yeah. We were working with a company and they're a medium sized company, a fashion company. And uh, you know, I never ever thought that I'd be working in the fashion industry, Bessie. But um, yeah, the things that where this takes you is just phenomenal. And we met with them and we we had a uh, an ask of, of fashion companies that they say within three years <laughs> that you can put up uh and this is a couple of years ago, um, all your first tier factories you're sourcing from. And so we met with this uh, person, the the head of sustainability and procurement, and uh, and they were pumped at nine o'clock on the on a Thursday morning, and on uh, they were telling us with incredible enthusiasm on the Thursday night at ten thirty p.m. at night, night uh, on, the, on the Tuesday night they had um, they had got up their last factory in tier one and they were pumped, and they were so excited and I said you know. Uh, um, Hey, you know, um, isn't it good to do good? And she so stopped and had this rapid eye movement. Yeah, but it wasn't just us and our team. The whole the whole office yesterday was so good. We had people ringing in managers from our shop saying, so good to be a part of a company that, that's doing the right thing and doing good. And I said, yeah, there's a real spirituality to this, isn't it? And she said, she stopped again and said, Buzz, this is about the soul. It's about the soul of the company, isn't it? I said, Oh, I think you're onto something there. You know, that's a good point. She said, that's it. What this has done for us has just been amazing because what we've done is that we've been able to actually say we're doing something that's important. And it it, it goes beyond. And she said, we know that's affected sales because we can say, to, and, and our floor staff and our shops are saying, you know, uh, and our company is actually really addressing modern slavery. And they say it with such pride and customers go, well, that's good, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And it has actually affected our sales because we want to tell that. Yeah, and it's tangible. I think if we go back to sometimes we can push against what seems like the soft things or using the word love or the word spirituality or that it's coming to, uh, you know, the plate example of it's actually recognising people as another human that has, you know, value just from the fact that they are here. And one of the pieces going back to your point, Carolyn, around the values side of this is that so often in an organization, values become meaningless and very generic. And yet this is a very practical piece where you can 
see the tangible results of behavior change and see it in action. And that creates the stickiness and alignment for both your staff or team and the customers, because you haven't just said, oh yes, we have a core value of um, integrity or where about, it's like, no, no, stop just talking. Show me what that looks like. Show me how you're making decisions. Prove to me from that transparency side that this is actually playing out in the way you do business. That's very tangible in this work. Very tangible. Absolutely. And in that line, we've been developing tools with other partner organisations around the world uh, because of the, the struggle with doing this, Bessie. And so we put our heads together with some uh, people who are ge genii um, in this area uh, and come up with them. And one of the big ones is how do we show that what we're doing is actually doing it? That, that's evidence-based. Um, reporting now is one of the big new areas that people are really looking at. So how do you have evidence base that what you're doing is just not that you're doing it, but it's having an effect both up and down in... Uh, which, in is, which is a very important point because if I think about, you know, 20 plus years ago in the early days of ethical investment where it had intention, but not necessarily measurability and the shift to impact investment is it's meant to have intention and measurability. I would argue many of the things that are classed as impact investments still just have intention and the measurability piece is catching up. But that is really important because I think as we make this uh, about or relevant for business owners, it's saying that good intentions aren't good enough, but the way you actually make money is as important as what you then do with it. So it's starting to kind of just connect some of these dots that I think for too long we've been allowed to see as externalities and, and push out as, as issues we don't need to deal with. I'm keen to pick up, you brought in the example of the fashion industry. And so if we shift gears for a moment and look at those businesses that are deeply in the space of production focus, so they are producing things and have uh, much more of a direct connection to these issues around supply chain. Are there specific things or ways that you've seen businesses kind of fall into common mistakes or traps as they begin to look at this or engage with suppliers around this issue when they are a production focused business? So uh, as we're moving into production, one of the big things is to try and really work out uh, what's happening on the factory uh, processing plant, um, uh, seafood processing, and all the different areas that are there um, in production side. And we've been working on on the values of this. We worked uh, with a, a extremely big uh, rubber glove company in Malaysia uh, and got some money. And, and seven of us as NGOs worked together to try and work out what are the new standards uh, against the emerging legislation around the world. And so what are we now looking? We're about to release that, actually. That's going to come out very, very soon. Um, and uh, one of the big things of that is how do you actually show what's happening on the floor? Now, you can do social audits, and they are very, very helpful for some, uh, except that um, uh, the accuracy uh, probably is about 30% if you're doing really well. Uh, and two, as a company, you need to learn how to read the report from a social auditor but the other one, and far more important, because social audits still will only interview at the most a few workers. We've been working on a tool that actually goes out from the workers. We call it the bottom-up uh, audit. So the workers actually say, based on the ILO, the International Labour Organization's indicators of forced uh, labour or any other tools, we, we, we base it on information that's coming from audits and from uh, trade data, et cetera. And so um, we've developed this platform called Million Makers where it can actually go out and workers can fill in a survey so that you get uh, the majority or a large percentage of the workers actually auditing what's happening. And so in particularly in production companies, it's the best way of actually finding out what's happening on 
the ground, on the floor, uh, amongst the workers, because the workers know generally more than anybody else in a factory or a, a, a production unit what is actually happening. Uh, and uh, so uh, we have struggled that one. And, and what evidence base can we have with that? And this is the best thing that we've come up with. And the wonderful thing we love is that the workers own their data. A lot of other times it's like, oh, a social auditor goes in, a company goes in, and they take their data, and they all make money out of it, but the worker doesn't, but it's the worker's data. And so and workers' time. And workers' time. So so it's, uh, it's self-sovereignty. It's part of the self-sovereignty movement. And anybody who wants that data pays again to actually get the data off that worker. So incentivize is that we pay them uh, equivalent, generally general principles about a day's wages to fill out the survey over five to 10 days. So we get uh, multiple data points to actually be able to show. And a company can say, listen, we, we did this worker voice um, platform and we can show you what's happened. The beauty is if you come across a, a problem in your supply chain, uh, you can do your interventions or your remediation then you can do it again because we've got the, the connection. It's all anonymized. The same connection, we can do it three, six, 12 months later and actually show the difference that it's made and things have changed. So this is where we think is, is one of the most important areas in that, uh, in, in, that in the production area, particularly busy. Can I ask a, a practical question on that? So if we go to the accounting side and the how do you even read those the the different information and data that's coming back and understand what's important from a measurement side and the work I've done as an impact investor I often find that it's that piece of if we have all of this information often we're not actually asking the right questions so how do we make sure and maybe i'm not understanding fully what the tool is maybe you've already done all of that work and depending what industry i mean you're saying these are the five kind of critical factors that you need to understand but how do we make sure we're not just collecting a bunch of data but it's actually not the right questions and it's not the drivers of change that are required? Because that's a critical first step. If we get that wrong, we can be paying for data that doesn't actually inform us or help us make decisions in a more insightful way. Yeah. And that's why we use the ILO indicators, because they're extremely well researched that these indicators are there. There's an indication that there may be modern slavery or there may be abuses that are happening. Um, we can add data points if there are specific issues, et cetera, that happen. But then the data is analysed. You don't just get raw data. You get an, an analysis and analysis of the uh, of the, the data that comes through. And, uh, of course, as we aggregate this more and more, we can put it against the common data to say you're in line with, you're ahead of, you're... Uh, you, you're a bit behind here. So we can actually also then do a comparison of uh, where you're sitting in the uh, in the anti-slavery um, indicators and detections. And, and I think it's 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 absolutely right that it's about asking the right questions because there there are a lot of social standards, et cetera. And they'll say, for example, you know you've got to have a first aid kit. And there's got to be a sign that's, you know, one and a half metres on the ground, um, three foot from a door um, <laughs> in seven different languages that points to the first aid kit. Now, so you would fail if, if it wasn't sitting right there. But the real question is, do you know where the first aid kit is? <laughs> um, and so what we would ask is, do you know where the first aid kit is? <laughs> um, not is there a sign that's that etc. So um it, it's asking about the real questions of the worker experience um in that place. So, and uh, you know, one just, of the just an example of that just very quickly is you know, you can say uh you would ask the question of do you have all these things that you're supposed to have? Uh, but the question we ask is, did you feel safe at work today? <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, because I think that's also a really important aspect as we start to measure or capture data. If we're not clear on, well, what was the outcome we were actually wanting? We can get a lot of output data of like, oh, it ticked these boxes. It's in the languages. But if when I go to that first aid kit, it's all out of date or there's nothing in it, in when I have injured myself 
I haven't got the outcome that we were actually trying to achieve here in terms of that safety. So like the, the outcome needs to be really clear of what would we be trying to achieve if this was in place. And I think sometimes that framing of the question actually leads us to feel confidence when we shouldn't really be confident. Yeah, that's sure. right. That's and right. so, again, it's back to the compliance one. And I was uh, sharing this with someone last night. I was speaking at a big conference in the UK and uh, the person who was my, one of the other co-speakers um, um, uh, put up this, this wonderful sign. She said, look, the, the difficulty is how do we, how do we just connect with people? How do we just get the, the real message through? And this sign was one of those wonderful big, black on yellow that says, danger, this sign has sharp edges. Do not come within three metres of this sign. You need to keep clear because this is a danger situation and it has sharp edges. And down the bottom in small letters it said, oh, by the way, the bridge is out. <laughs> and I think it, it's, it, it's, it's not just the compliance of the things that you're supposed to be doing. It's what's actually happening and how do we get to know the realities? Because unless you're dealing with realities, you're never going to be able to really uh, solve some of the struggles and certainly the slavery areas, that modern slavery uh, areas that we're talking about. I don't know whether you want to go deeper into this, but, you know, that Fuzz gave the example of the companies that have put up their factories. So a number of, over 10 years ago now, uh, there was a factory um in fact, it, it's the largest industrial uh, accident in the world where a, where a clothing um, factory called Rana Plaza collapsed and over 1,300 people were killed. Now, there'd been auditors in a couple of days beforehand that said everything's fine, um, but the workers had been saying there's cracks opening, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we can hear the creaking of the walls. We can hear the creaking of the walls um, and... It, it, obviously, everything was not fine. Now there were there were companies and there um, who, in the rubble of Rana Plaza, their labels were found, and um, that's not good for a company. In fact, the company that had just put all of its factories up was one of the companies whose labels were found, and their response at that time was, "We didn't know our goods were being made in that factory, and they were telling you the truth." Mm. Um, at that time, around 80% of fashion companies didn't know the factories that their buyers were sourcing from. Now, if you don't know where your goods are coming from, then you do, you can't know what's actually happening there. And so that was part of the first step of, well, actually now it's over 80% do know and the majority will publish their factory lists. You, Some don't because uh, they say it's competitive um, in, in confidence, but, yeah. What was a big change, the huge change in this, Bessie, was the, the wonderful work of John Ruggie with the United Nations in 2010 and 2011. They brought in the United Nations Guiding Principles for Businesses and uh, and businesses said those things that Carolyn just said to us again and again, but we don't know. You know the, the Guiding Principles said, it is the responsibility of any company, uh, any business to know right down through the whole of their supply chain and you are responsible for the whole of your supply chain. That was just a real turnaround and a game changer and that's where we've seen the massive changes that we have seen and the massive changes needed now for businesses to be aware of. What is the level, so when you think about all of the organisations you've worked with and the issues around supply chain, so I hear you about that framing of, yes, you are responsible all the way back into the supply chain, but typically how how many layers back does someone have to go to have actually achieved that? Most, most of uh, our experiences and all the companies that we've been working with in the sectors is um, uh, on probably the majority, it, it, slavery happens in tier three, four, five and below. And so getting just to the first tier and sometimes even to the second tier, you're not going to hit it, is actually down in the deeper levels of your supply chain. So it's um, so you do have to go a, a, a few levels down. Um, we, we, we say anywhere that you're blind mm. can be a potential problem. So it, it's it's both 
um, the depth into your supply chain, and that differs with different commodities and different industries, and we haven't got time to go into that. Um, but uh, but it's also where you're blind. So where there might be subcontractors being used, um, where there might be labour hire agents that are actually the employing body rather than than your supplier, um, where there's there's outsourcing, um, where there's use of home workers. Now, there's some very good um, home worker associations and regulations that do fabulous things to make sure that home workers aren't in conditions of modern slavery, and then there are some others. Um, so so it's wherever you can't see, that's where your risk is. One of the things we've been working on in this regard, Bessie, which we are incredibly excited about, and again, what we do is we try and work out where are the struggles, where are the blockages, how can we innovate to actually work on what we do about that. And one of the areas is is supply chain checking and really getting down those depths. But the other the other struggle that's there uh, uh, is really so how do we access these tools? How do we get next? The, what's the accessibility of them? And uh, we've been working with Sydney University on the Oasis project, and um, um, it's in the supply chain school, which sits in the School of Physics, which we continually ask. What is this doing in the School of Physics? And a very practical reason, they have the trade data of all the commodities in the world, all the shipping data, where everything comes from, right across from, from sea, uh, land, air, etc. cetera. So the, the, the size of the database is so huge. The physics department was the only one that had a computer big enough to crunch the numbers because that's where the astrophysics is, and they crunch the numbers of all the telescopes in the world. And so, and they say, oh, we love this. Uh, the astrophysicists uh, say, we've got the head of the department in, and he's one of the top three astrophysicists in the world. And he said, what you're doing is what we try and do in astrophysics, which is we take data, how do we visualize it? so that people can understand it. So we've been working on this. So we've got the tool worked out now. It's at the proof of... Uh, it's past uh, proof of concept. <laughs> yeah, it's gone past proof of concept. Um, and we're, we're just looking for the support now uh, uh, to get it, to actually get it up, because we want it to be free. So the company, no matter what size, can go, and, and, and we get really um, annoyed um, that um, these tools that actually help people to do it, businesses to do this, are so expensive so often. And we're going, but this is a human rights issue. Why should it be so expensive to get on the very thing of, of humans helping humans? So we want it to be free. Every time we say that, and we said it to government and the businesses and uh, others, you kind of get this rapid eye movement of, Free. <laughs> oh, that's an interesting concept uh, because we think it needs to be universally uh, be able to use. So uh, a company can put in what their spend is, what their procurement is, uh, who they procure that from, and in 15 seconds they can go down to tier five in tracing through where those goods probably came from to allow you to do that. So th these are the things that we struggle with in trying to work out how can we innovate, how can we be creative of taking these things, all of us putting our heads together, and that project is academics, it's NGO, it's business people, all working together to say, what's the blockage? What can we do to actually come to this point? And it's just really good working with people who are geniuses uh, in, in how to do that <laughs> and put the heads together like that and we can come up with phenomenal things to make a difference. That's a really good point because if we think about all of the aspects of, of the conversation today, there are many of these components that do actually require a level of expertise and deep knowledge in the area. It can't just be that Bessie suddenly decides she's going to examine the supply chain, you know, with no actual skill in that area. How does someone who is a business leader who is now thinking, okay, I'm going to begin the journey to, to figure out what that roadmap is, how do they decide which pieces are at the level of, say, strategy? And as the leader, they are setting the tone of this is what we care about, this is where we're wanting to be, like I'm setting the vision of where we're going. How do they decide which bits can be done internally, but it's not them, they're going to pass it to someone in their team who will drill into things? 
And how do they decide the third level of when they actually need external help from someone who is an expert in this? How does that work? There's a process that companies need to go through and businesses need to go through. First of all, awareness. Uh, and and as we mentioned before about what's the language? How do we talk about this? How do we understand the terms of what's happening here? Uh, and that can be done at all sorts of levels. That's that, There's a couple of short courses around. You know, nations do one. Law departments, universities do that. And uh, if you make it through the third lesson of that or session of that, you know, you know, you, you're working into a, you know, becoming a lawyer very, very soon now. Um, so there's a variety of those, but there are some good ones that are stuff to do that. The next one is how do we learn to see it and how do we work out what our values are and what we want to do about this? The third one is. What's the strategies uh, or what the policies we're going to develop? What's the strategies that we put in place to do that? And how do we then assess that, that we're actually investing in things which are making a difference? So it's not just about efficiency, it's about effectiveness. And, and there are a couple of things that we do that we found. I mean, one of the things we often say, Bessie, is there are no experts in this. Yeah. Um, if there were, we would have solved it, and we haven't. There are lead um, learners. There are lead learners. <laughs> and, and one of the things that we found is that when we get businesses and business leaders together, the level of learning that they have from each other is, is yep. extraordinary um, in terms of sharpening them. So a couple of things that we do, uh, we have a business association, which um, they they generate what we do in terms of webinars and uh, and resources and tools. And in that business association, we have a concierge service where people can ring up and say, I want to know about X, Y, Z. And if we don't know, we'll find who does know. Um, part of what we do in that is we also run a fight club um, for uh, sustainability staff. It tends to be procurement sustainability staff. We have done for some short-term ones for CEOs. And, and basically, you know, the rules of the Fight Club is you don't talk about Fight Club, but it's also nothing is off the agenda. So it's a safe place. We don't go to that. We don't way. go to it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we're not allowed to go. Uh, they do invite us every now and then to to be the lead learners, but we we don't tend to go to it. Um, so uh, so that's a safe place where you can come and ask any question. No question is regarded as dumb, and um, and you will then have a think tank of other people who are in similar situations to you, who you can talk that through with. So. I, again, I, th I think you'll see a common theme in how we approach this, Bessie. It's collaboration, it's joint learning, it's um, uh, sh shared you know, practice, you know, can... communities of of um, of learning, and so on that will generate the solutions to this. What one of our bylines is continuously. Um looking at and saying um, the only way we're going to change and stop slavery is together. And I think that's where collaboration is absolutely key. And and we partner wherever we can partner. And I think this is the principle, I think, that applies to businesses in this, of saying as they go through those steps of saying, what can we do internally? What do we need help with? And, and you know, as a business, you'll know that. Uh, you know, what do we need to upskill on uh, so that we can do it internally? Or what do we do? Or who can we join with to do that? We often, uh, we partner with sometimes some very, very big organisations and uh, and businesses. Uh, and uh, we, we kind of often feel like the elephant and the mouse, we're the mouse walking across the bridge and we look up the elephant and go, boy, we really rock this bridge, don't we? <laughs> and I think sometimes uh, we've found that our capacity grows with every partnership that we have because we learn more, we share more, and together we actually can do more. And that's why we think collaboration uh, and in businesses, absolutely essential. Get with the others who've got shared values, who've got the same struggles and challenges and, and, and start talking together and working together. And uh, often you share who together and, and maybe you can do a, a contract or, or something together, which will be cheaper often than doing just business by business. Yeah, so as we wrap up the the conversation today, are there any pieces as sort of parting words or ideas that 
you both feel you wish that business leaders would reflect on or change in their practice? Like just what would you like to leave us with today? I guess one is the question of what sort of business do you really want to be? In other words, you know, uh, by reputation and more than anything else, it's about the culture of a business. Uh, it's about how you apply your, your values, how you treat your staff, how you know your supply chain, how you do well in developing your best business model and your best proficiency and, and professionalism or whatever words you want to use around that. But how do we be a good business and then do it? Strategize it, work out your roadmap, work towards doing that. Don't try and do everything at once, but gradually move forward in incorporating these things so that you get the deep meaning of your work and you get the satisfaction of the business that it is, yes, about making money and also having an impact in the world. Uh, I, I guess um, what I would say is start somewhere um, and and that might be something that is is really simple, like at, as a response to Rana Plaza, uh, just to raise awareness about forced labour, modern slavery, um, one of the things that some companies did was they had a wear your clothes inside out day. Um, so you can see the label. So then you 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 do the you ask people. So where do your clothes come from? Um, because we don't often ask that question, um, and we've got some resources on our website that you can use that that then help to 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 answer that question. And it's just a really simple awareness raising kind of thing that you can do. Um, we've got uh, we're recording this leading up to Easter, and we do a chocolate scorecard, uh, which you can use at other times other than Easter, obviously. But, um, you know, you can you can distribute that. You can have chocolate tasting of the chocolates that scored well and the chocolates that didn't score well, and can you tell the difference? Uh, one can you of the taste the difference? Is, yeah. Can you taste the difference? <laughs> one of the good things is that often the good scoring chocolates actually taste the best as well. Um, so, um, so, yeah, bring it in um, into every, everyday life for people first. Do something to raise the awareness, uh, and it's better to take an action than it is to 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 get all of the information. There's no end to the information you can get. Yeah, and and that's really important, I think, to avoid that overwhelm and and as you said, then falling into the trap of doing nothing, which we want to avoid. Yeah. So. It's been wonderful to have you both as those lead learners um, <laughs> to share with us uh, much of what you you have been um, engaging with and, and seeing over many years. So I'm very thankful for your time. What is the best way if someone wants to reach out to you or, as you said, tap into things, where should they go to get some more information? So they can go to our website, which is uh, the W's and Be Slavery Free dot com right but so we'll, we'll share that in the notes yeah, yeah we'll send you um the different things that we've talked about a few different websites that we've talked about that that people could go to great thank you so much and i hope that even if today it's a little bit overwhelming and maybe you even need to listen to it again <laughs> i hope that as you're engaging with starting to shift the way you're thinking or even dial into the fact that this might be something that you need to start to think about in your business, please hear that comment at the end there around just start somewhere, begin the process. And I would say go into it with that pragmatic approach of not being a purist about it and then doing nothing, but pragmatically going in and and just see it as a journey because the role that business can play is so massive. It is far more impactful for each of us as a business owner, a business leader to take responsibility for the pieces we have control over than to spend a whole bunch of time and make donations and yet not change our behavior. So let's start by bringing the desire to do good and contribute back inside the business. Thank you for tuning in.